Welcome back to the Athlete Hackers Podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And I am Mark Spellman. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Um, before we get going with our guest today, uh, Pat Murphy, the, uh, the Executive Director of Athletics at Marywood University. A couple things I want to talk about. Uh, first, our last episode with Charles Stevenson. Um, we kind of were all over the place talking about college athletics um, and probably the evolution of what's coming toward to college athletics with paying um, student athletes and maybe um, the super league that might be coming to college athletics. Um, yeah, that, and, he, you know, there's one thing I, I realized about that podcast. I want to make sure the listeners hear right away. And that is we cover a lot of different topics and the title and the description may be misleading. So you got to listen through the whole podcast because, um, uh, Coach gave an incredible, I, I, I put him on the spot as, as, as tends to happen sometimes, but I, I asked him about the fashion training and basketball players, and he gave quite an incredible description of what the human body does when it's playing the game of basketball from a physical, scientific, strength and conditioning coach's perspective. And, and it put everything on kind of one page on what it is. And, you know, we talk about cross training as being one of the best um, quivers in your, in your, no, arrow in your quiver, arrows in your quiver um, to become a better athlete. And basketball, the sport of basketball itself is a great way to train your fascia system if you're playing baseball or football or soccer or whatever. So, um, make sure you listen all the way through because that information doesn't get in until about 30 to 33 minutes in. So make sure you listen to our entire podcast. The other topic that I really want to bring up today before we talk with Mr. Murphy is um, Naomi Osaka, um, number one uh, women's tennis player in the world. Um, before the French Open started uh, last week, she told uh, everybody she didn't want to do the press. Um, she was dealing with some mental health issues. Um, really didn't want to talk with the press after matches and, you know, didn't really get too far into why she didn't want to or what she was dealing with. Um, and everybody was okay with it. Plays her first match, doesn't show up to the press conference. WTA finds her $15,000. She goes, okie dokie, I, I withdraw from the tournament. I have to take care of myself and whatever I'm dealing with. Um, once again, I've been open and honest and very candid about my um, struggles and issues with mental health on our podcast. And I believe um, a bunch of professional and high level athletes have brought this to light as well. Kevin Love and Michael Phelps being uh, two prominent athletes, um, and also Naomi Osaka, obviously, right now. As a professional athlete, yes, you have responsibilities on and off the court, the field, um, wh whatever you're doing um, as a professional. But at the same time, you need to take care of yourself first and foremost. Um, if you're dealing with something, whether it be mentally, physically, emotionally, um, you need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself first and foremost. And I'll, and I'll say that to everybody that's listening. If you're dealing with something, please understand that whatever you're going through right now is temporary. Um, it will go, it will pass. Um, but make sure that if you need help, that you're getting the help that you need. Uh, because I strongly believe that the world is a better place for you being in it. So I congratulate Naomi for taking care of herself and not dealing with the crap that the professional tennis organization or association is requiring her to do. Um, and I hope, I hope she's able to come back after that she gets the care and help that she needs and uh, goes back to where she, where she is happy in playing tennis. So. Yeah. And mental health, obviously, first and foremost, it's, um, you know, so that you can live a full life and you're there for your friends and family, but secondarily, it also affects your performance. And that's something we've got into a little bit on this podcast, and we're going to get into a lot deeper in future podcasts. But um, your mental health and your 
state of your mind is arguably the most important thing in sports. Yep. Just like your motor is in your car. You could have a Porsche, you could have a Porsche, a Porsche body and a Hugo engine. So <laughs> it's not the way to go. Um, okay. Sorry to start the podcast out on that note, but now it is my honor. It's my privilege to, uh, bring on a gentleman that has been in the life has been in my life for the last two decades. Um, we first got together, uh, when we were both at Fairfield university, Patrick Murphy, currently the executive director of athletics at Marywood university in Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Well, I think the, the pleasure is all mine, Mark and Chris. Thank you so much. I, I've tuned into your podcasts. Uh, every time it comes up, uh, I'm a big fan. Thank I think it's very one. well done. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's extremely well done. And I think you educate and inform people on not only strength and conditioning, but all the different things that are going on in the world, world of pretty much collegiate athletics. So uh, I tip my hat to you guys. And it's a real pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Um, I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to start hot with this. Oh, cool. All right. I'm sitting so, down. Uh, here we go. Oh, this is, this is new. <laughs> not, not at all. Um, for those that don't know, and uh, basically dealing with talking to high school athletes, um, parents of high school athletes, what does a director of athletics do? Well, <laughs> I guess it depends who you ask. No, I think I think the director of athletics, you know, it's a it's a total administrative job. Obviously, you hire the coaches. Um, you're dealing with budgets. You're dealing with marketing. You're dealing with fundraising. You're dealing with licensing and merchandising. You're putting out fires all day long. Um, you're handling game management. Um, but but at the end of the day, you're the last line of defense to the to the upper administration or the president's office as to running the day to day operations of the athletic department. Um, but my thing is, if you hire the right people underneath you, your job becomes a lot simpler and a lot easier if you have the trust in the people you have. Yes. And, for and, I'm, and I'm very fortunate at Mary what I have. I have a, a couple great associate ADs here, and we have a great uh, coaching staff here, so so it makes everything really easy. And I think I think what you said there, uh, you you are the leader of a business. I mean, collegiate athletics at every level is a business. It, it, Mark, it really is a business. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a coach. I don't pretend to be a coach. But, you know, I could figure out budgets and marketing and fundraising and things along those lines. And, yeah, at the end of the day, it's revenue in, expenses out. It's a business. And, and, and for those athletes that are making the jump from high school athletics to college athletics, whether it be Division One, Division Two, D Division Three, NAIA, JUCO, understand what, what uh, Mr. Murphy just said. It is a business. So the coach that you are playing for, it's not personal. They are hired to win games. I've had, I've had athletes before. Why, do, why don't I play? Why don't I play? It's because you're not better than the person in front of you that's playing. It's, and it's not personal. It's, it's just the reality. I mean, how many coaches have you kept on staff that have losing records? Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, well, here's the thing, Mark. I tend to look at a body of work more than, mm -hmm. than, than a record. So in other words, People can have a bad year. It, it happens. You know what I'm saying? But we can't afford to have six or seven bad years in a row. Yes. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't do anyone any, any good. Um, from the alumni right up through the upper administration, you know, people, you know, if you're going to have an athletic program and you're going to invest the money in, in which a lot of money is invested in these programs, a university wants to see a, a return on their investment. You know, so whatever we do here, we want to do it well. And that's, that's the bottom line. When, when you're in the process of hiring or we'll go more into the sports performance, strength and conditioning realm. Uh, so for the young coaches that are listening, what would you be looking for, for somebody to run 
uh, your university or a university strength and conditioning department or sports performance department? What are the, what would be the, some of the key key things a young strength coach should know when they're applying for a job at a universe at the university level? From a strength and conditioning standpoint or a coaching standpoint? Uh, we'll go strength and conditioning first, and then maybe coaching second. Well, obviously, you want someone that's certified that has that checks all the boxes that you know that educationally, and they've gone through all the tests and all of that 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 they can do the job. That's number one. Number two, what I would do, Mark, is I look for a fit. Okay, I want someone that can come in and be a fit within the athletic department. I, and, and what I say is doesn't necessarily have to get along with every coach, but every coach needs to respect them and they need to respect the coaches. But another thing I'll do is like, you know, and this goes across any position I have, Mark, is that we always ask for references, right? But I never, I will never call anyone's reference. And the reason for that is why would you, you know, they're, they put those references on a sheet for a reason because they know they're going to get a good reference so if let's say you went to frostburg state right so if i was looking at mark spellman at frost and he's coming straight out of college at frostburg even though we probably wouldn't hire a strength and conditioning coach straight out of college but i would ask someone that i knew at frostburg hey what do you think about mark spellman because that way you're going to get more of an objective uh um, answer to what you're really all about Okay. No, but, it's but, but it's interesting you say that um, our, our one of our guests, Pat Hall, said something similar about his recruiting process where he will sit back. You had Pat Hall on his show? Sorry. Yeah, he's been on. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Those are big shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he said, you know, he'll sit back and he'll watch a player, how they interact with their teammates, with their family. You know, so it's it's just a, a heads up if you're going for a job or you're going for a scholarship, you know, you might be trying to line all the things up the right way where you think people are looking, but they're looking when you're not. Well, it's funny you say that because Gino Oriama, and we all know who Gino Oriama is, said one time, or, or I listened to him, Mark, you may have heard this as well. Chris, you may have heard it as well. Is that, is that when he goes out to a game to see a player, before he even steps on a plane or a wherever to go see this kid, he knows the kid can play. Okay. He knows that kid is good enough to play for the university of Connecticut, or he wouldn't be there in the first place. He's not watching the game. He's watching to see how that person reacts when they're taken out of the game, what their body language is like. Are they cheering on their, their, their teammates? Are they attentive in huddles? That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for, you know, did she, did did she hit thirty points? He, he already knows she can do that. He's looking for the other stuff, and I think it's I think it's very important for the younger people to realize how important it is to be a good teammate, and it's not a skill that everyone has, especially especially the, today, especially today, and and the elite athlete because you know they're in this bubble where everyone's telling them how good they are all the time and everyone's catering to them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this has gone on for a long period of time as well, but it, it, it's so difficult for these people, or I shouldn't say difficult. The mindset of them should really be on, let's trying to be a good teammate because people out there that are recruiting you at the highest of levels are still looking at that as a, uh, um, well, they're just looking at it to see, do we want this person or do we not want this person as part of the program? So a fit, we want to fit in this athletic department. And, and I've, got, I've got a, I've got a good story about that. When we were at our, at uh, Fairfield, there was an athlete yeah. being recruited by one of the, by one of the teams there. Um, and they were in for the weekend, um, you know, stayed the night, stayed with the team was being hosted by somebody. Um, it gets to the end of the visit. And uh, the coach sits the, the mom and the daughter down. Oh, okay, it's a female athlete, obviously. <laughs> sits them both down and goes, I'm not recruiting you anymore um, based off of how you talk to your mother. Um, 
And she's like, what? And he was like, if you're going to talk to your mother that way, how are you going to talk to my assistant coach? How are you going to talk to your teammates? How are you going to talk to our support staff? I mean, if you're going to talk and be disrespectful to the person, and he was just watching her interactions the whole weekend with, with her mother. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm not recruiting you anymore. So her, her, the way she talked to her mother wound up costing her $250,000. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, and I, and I get it, you know, I mean, you know, listen, no one's perfect and I understand that, but you know, the people that can do the little things and be good teammates, you know, it's part of a fit or, you know, I look at a staff, okay. An athletic staff is, is we're, we're a team too. You know, you don't want a cancer within that team because what a cancer does is they become decisive or they divide. And that's, and that's what you don't want. No, I'll also look at, I'll, I'll also look at the athletes and I'll look at the coaches and staff members and I'll see how they interact with uh, the custodian. Yeah. And I'll see how they, they interact with people that can't do anything for them. Or if they're always, or if they'll just talk to the people that can help them get ahead. Um, so. Well, I'm a firm believer that the custodian is one of the most important people in your building. They're the ones that have the keys to get you wherever you need to go and <laughs> things. So. And, and they also know they also know what's going on when the lights are off. Exactly. So. Exactly. Um, Pat, how okay. um, how much does the athletic director get involved with? Um, recruiting so i mean do you do you have hands-on with particular recruits as they're uh potentially coming into the school or is it more administrative kind of from a, a, a top level perspective i get involved if the coach wants me to get involved okay so in other words we hire coaches and coaches are there to do their job okay so if a, if a coach comes to me and says hey look i've got a a young men's soccer player, or a young women's soccer player, I'd like for you to meet with them in the family. I'd be more than happy to do that. But it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a requirement because, you know, at the very end of the day, the recruit coming in has to have that relationship with their coach because coaches act like a, a mother or father to that student athlete. So, you know, the, the short, the, the answer to your question is, is that I can be as involved as they want me to be, or I can be as not as involved as they want me to be, but I leave that up to the coaches. Here's the next one. Where do you see college athletics going? And, and I'm gonna preface this with uh, coming off of the NCAA basketball tournament. Uh, obviously we saw what happened between the men and the women's uh, programs and the disparage between what the men's uh, basketball uh, tournament had and what the women had. Uh, we've talked about it on this podcast several times, um, but I'm a firm believer um, that I think that the NCAA, uh, I think the the model that the NCAA currently has is, is not working. Um, it's not working for the athletes. Um, it's not working for those that don't have a big time football and basketball program to the point where I think it's really going to break out into uh, a four conference 16 teams in each conference, like Super League, um, where you have a North, South, East, West um, in each conference, or in each conference, you have two eight team divisions in each conference. Um, the top two play each other, then you go down to four, then you go down to two, then you have a national championship, and all 64 teams will be in the basketball tournament. Um, I only say that because, I mean, as you know, it, it is big time business, and Coach K has already talked about it with him retiring or announcing his retirement yesterday. Um, the NCAA basketball tournament or basketball um, business is a billion dollar a year industry. Um, what are your thoughts on how to better serve the student athlete? Um, and do you foresee any um, evolution or growth or change within the current model that the NCAA has well let me let me start let me start by saying this what you're talking about a super league and you're, you're probably talking about the, the power power conferences the five power conferences that talk has been happening for at least 
20 years, 25 years, that they were going to break away, have their own super conference, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not saying that won't happen. Um, I think the power five level schools don't want to share the revenue with the, with the other 300 or 280, whatever, whatever that figure is, other division one schools or in, in the conferences. See, people don't realize this. Most of division one is made up of mid-majors. Two thirds of division one are mid-majors. It's the Fairfields of the world, the central Connecticut's of the world. Um, do I see that happening down the road? Possibly, you know, the one thing that's got to be worked out is that, or I don't know how they're going to do this, but, you know, the NCAA men's basketball tournament, and we can throw the women in there too. But let's just focus on the men right now. You know, CBS pays like a billion dollars for that tournament, for the rights, okay? But why is it of value to CBS? I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to reverse it here. Why is, why is that a value to CBS? It's a business decision. It, that, that's the cost of them getting advertisers for the commercials, and they know they're going to make $4 billion or $5 billion on it. Correct. But the value, the true value in that tournament is the first weekend because America wants to tune in and see the upsets. Mm. They want to see Iona beat Michigan. That's where the true value is. The value in that tournament wanes as, as you get further and further down the line. Interesting. So the, the money is all in that first weekend. That's where the bars are packed. That's where everyone's tuned in. That's where no one's in their offices or watching the games. Um, so I don't know if you, if you were to go to a, a Super League, per se, I don't know if it would still have the um, – the sexiness to see Michigan upset Seton Hall as it would be having Fairfield beat Seton Hall. Do you follow, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, that's very interesting. So, so I don't know. Um, there's certain things. First of all, let's, let's talk about the discrepancy this year. In, in the year 2021, in the 50th anniversary, by the way, of Title IX, the fact, the embarrassment that the NCAA must have had with uh, the discrepancy between the women's basketball tournament and the men's basketball tournament. Yeah, that's unbelievable to me. Now, Mark can tell you this, we did several um, women's basketball regionals at Fairfield University and um, and I happen to be the tournament director of those. And to me, it's unbelievable that at the final, well, it wasn't the final four, but it was the tournament in general, right? Yeah. How that discrepancy happened because, you know, what people don't realize, the women's basketball that runs the women's basketball tournament is totally separate from the men's basketball tournament. They're two separate staffs. They're almost like two different companies all fall under the NCAA's umbrella. But in my dealings with the women's basketball people, I, I find it really hard to believe that this discrepancy happened. Yeah, and it, it, for those that don't know, it just wasn't in the uh, facilities, but it also had a lot to do with the catering as well. Oh, I yeah. Mean, I, saw, I saw a bunch of posts from a lot of the women players on how they were being fed compared to the guys, where the guys had like a five-star buffet and the women had like box, box lunches. Yeah, it, 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 it's definitely concerning that this – this happened or was allowed allowed to happen i think that's the better word for it yeah um all right here's another one i'm i'm coming rapid fire chris um right now in my profession in the strength and conditioning sports performance realm there's a um there's a, there's kind of an issue on who's overseeing us and how how we are reviewed um what makes a successful sports and performance strength and conditioning program? Is it teams win championships? Teams are healthier. They're, they got stronger. They got fitter. Uh, I mean, I've had, I've done several reviews on myself. Um, 
because that's how uh, Fairfield University wanted to set it up. Um, but then, you know, at the end of the day, what would you consider a successful strength and conditioning sports performance program? And what would you see as being an ideal model with them working with the sports medicine athletic training side of the uh, building? Well, let me, let me try to take this. First of all, the strength and conditioning area is of utmost importance in, in the success of an athletic program. Let's just go back, let's just go back 25 years, okay? Back when I played, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Now, if you take a look at the athletes then versus the athletes today, and kids today are probably more, they're not as active as that when we were, when we were younger, I think it's fair to say, they're just not, they're, they're playing video games, they're doing this. But when you watch Baylor play for the national championship, the athleticism on that Baylor team was just through the roof. Yeah. Absolutely through the roof. You can't compare that Baylor team to the North Carolina teams of 1985. That's how that's how much stronger they looked, how much faster they looked, and how much quicker they looked. What attributes to that? Strength and conditioning, training. I um, chose them to, to be in the national championship based on their size. Oh. Shout out to my boy, Charlie Melton, again. Come on, Charlie. Oh, it's unbelievable. So obviously it works, Mark. Obviously the strength and conditioning thing is paramount to having a great uh, team. I think in a perfect world, how the setup should be is you should have a coordinator or director of sport performance and underneath him, he hires um, strength and conditioning coaches and it all funnels up to this, to this gentleman. I don't think an athletic director should have that much of a say over sports performance, because let's be honest with us. We have so much leeway as athletic directors, but we really don't know anything about strength and conditioning. We don't. With that, I think, with that being said, what is your opinion on athletic coaches having a say in who is the director of strength and conditioning? Say, for example, an Urban Meyer at Ohio State hiring Mickey Marotti, uh, Steve Sarkeesian at University of Texas hiring his own person, bringing in a whole new staff. Where you see a turnover in an athletic department at, at, at a football coach or a basketball coach level maybe every three to five every three to six years potentially and a whole new staff being brought in just because a new coach is being hired i'm guessing mark at that level it's probably part of their contract when they're hired that they get to hire or they have the, the autonomy to hire who they want uh working with them it's probably like um uh, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, let's just say it's not part of the contract. Okay. And let's just say, let's, let's, let's take a fair field for instance. Okay. We hire a new basketball coach. Should that basketball coach have the autonomy to hire the strength and conditioning coach? Well, my answer to that is no, he should not because the strength and conditioning coach has got to work with all of our sports, not just the men's basketball. And if the men's basketball coach is hiring the strength and conditioning coach, where's the loyalty going to lie? The loyalty is going to lie with the men's basketball coach and not with anyone else. So to me, that model just does not work at the mid-major or, or the smaller universities at all. Now, I will also say this, from, a, from an athletic administration standpoint, I always say I'm smart enough to realize I'm not that smart. Okay. And, and when I say that, I actually mean it. And what I mean by that, and I tell our coaches this, we are not athletic trainers. We are not strength and we're not certified to be strength and conditioning people. Okay. Don't question them. Okay. You, you don't have the certification. You do not have the background. You do not have the knowledge to determine whether a player can come back from injury or is ready to go. Okay, that's a trainer's decision or that's strength and conditioning's decision or, or two of them together. We are not in that position to make that decision. And, I, and that's one thing that we just do not do here. So it seems to me just- <clears throat> Everyone has to, Chris, Chris, the bottom line is everyone needs to stay in their own lane. 
Yeah, I know. Um, I, and I, I agree with that, but it, it seems like in a perfect world, you would have that, that hierarchy of someone who knows the strength and conditioning field making decisions on the performance of a coach and whether they should stay or go. But then you get the issue of, of budgets and, and, and contracts, you know, whether a team is, is going to get the coach that they want or not because he's making some demands. So uh, is that accurate that it, it, it's really coming down to money and the size of the school? You know, whether that not they can hire someone to oversee and, and evaluate strength and conditioning coaches? I don't know if it's really money or, or it's or it's the carrot that they need for that to, to get that coach on board that they really want that coach on board. I would be more worried about where the loyalties lie. Now, now if you're at a big school and you have the luxury of having ten strength and conditioning coaches, you know, then then I probably would be okay that football had their own guy and it was someone that head coach knew and could work with and all that but again you're talking about there's probably 50 schools in the country that are like that you know most of division one and, and, and on down are, are much smaller schools where let's say you know, we'll go back to fairfield fairfield had the luxury of be able, being able to hire one person well that one person and god bless you mark for doing this he was responsible for the strength and conditioning of 40 student athletes, or no, I'm sorry, 400 student athletes, okay? And not every sport uses the same muscle group or ligament group or whatever. Every, everyone's training regimen is different. Soccer is much different than basketball. That, that, was a, that was a huge undertaking that Mark took on. And from and, and my observations, it. each team equally got Mark's wrath. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Mark, though. Mark, Mark really cared about the student athletes. Yeah. He really, really cared about the student athletes, and he really took great pride in them being come, becoming stronger, faster, better athletes, but even better people. And I commend Mark for that, and I mean that sincerely. Y'all are going to make me cry. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. And, and, I want to edit that out, Chris. <laughs> not, not a chance the checks the checks in the mail um i mean the saying goes and it's always going to be the same in my profession nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care i mean i'm never going to go into an, an, an environment where i'm dealing with an athlete and i'm going to first get to know them first and foremost as a human being and i'm going to give a i'm going to give a damn about them outside of the four walls of the building that we're in um just so that they know and, and I've said this a bunch of times, you give me four years of your life. Unfortunately, I'm in your life until I'm dead. So uh, there's a bunch of athletes that I still stay in contact with um, from Fairfield, a bunch of athletes I stay in contact with from Villanova. But that's, that's, the, that's the real reward for me at the end of the day. It's great. I mean, Mark, Pat, as you know, it's great to get championship rings, put banners up in a building. But at the end of the day, I want to see that you're a good husband a good wife, a good mom, a good dad, and a productive member of society. Well, I yeah, mean, you're working hard, Mark, for four years for the next 40. Exactly. Is what, it, is what it comes down to. And also, I think, too, Mark, is that is where this is a huge help is, is that you're teaching them how to work hard. You're teaching <laughs> them like, to be disciplined. Like, you're teaching them to show up on time. You're teaching them all of life skills disguised in, 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 a, in a training program, but it's still life skills that they need to take with them for the next 40 years of their life. Yeah, well, and that words of struggle. Yeah. Well, and that life isn't fair and you can do everything possible in your own efforts and you, you, you could still lose. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. It's, it's okay. It's okay to lose, but you know, you got to mark every team in the country, up. every team in the country usually ends the season with a loss. Except for there's one. Only, there's one, there's one team that's happy at the end of the year. And I say that about everybody. How's LeBron feeling today? Do you think <laughs> he's probably a little pissed off? Like he, he's not, he's looking up, he's looking up. He's, he's probably giving Damien Lillard a call going, Hey, get the hell out of Portland. Come down here. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to feel sorry for him, but <laughs> I mean, 
I had his that, bank account, I'd be okay too. <laughs> but but and, and to, honestly, when you get to that level, and and very few people get to that level, now it's about his legacy. And 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 between him and Kobe and everybody, they're trying to get to seven rings because they want to get one past Michael. Yeah, it's 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 not even about money at this point. He's got more money than he he, he could ever spend. It's more about how is he going to go down in history. Yeah, yep. exactly. You know, and and I think everybody everybody forgets everybody's chasing Michael, but at the end of the day, the gentleman that has the most rings ever is Bill Russell. Yeah. And if you take if you take it one step further, the person that has the most rings ever is Phil Jackson or Red Auerbach. <laughs> you know, if you really want to get into that kind of contest, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, we all use athletics to um, make individuals better. Uh, I always tell people to be 1% better than you were yesterday. And uh, at the end of the day, try and be the best version of yourself so you can help others become the best version of themselves. I yeah. mean, you're always, you're always paying it forward. Well, you know, Mark, see this right behind me right here. Yes, sir. So you knew I was a soccer player in college, right? Yes, sir. So what university did I go to? I believe it was Marshall. And they just won the national championship. Yes, they did. And I was fortunate enough that I, I had a conversation with my coach that, I, that, um, that recruited me to Marshall and I played, played there for him. And, you know, you don't know it at the time, Mark, but the, how positive an experience it is to play under someone that you respect a great deal and, and teaches you so much, not just about playing the game, but about life. You know what I'm saying? How to be a good teammate, how to communicate with your teammates, how to respect each other. Um, you know, you know, how, I to work, to him, how to work, how to work with somebody that you don't like. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, you know, I, I tell my staff here, Mark, I say to my staff, I said, you don't have to like everyone each other but you will respect each other mm -hmm. okay but um i just have a uh, i'm just so grateful that that this man who was my coach was in my life and uh all he taught me and unfortunately it takes you years for it to really sink in as to the lessons you are taught you know so um you know that's something i'll take with me the rest of my life and, and i'm glad we reconnected were you, were you able to get down there for the championship game? No, I wasn't. Uh, I had too many things going on up here. I watched it on television, and uh, I thought they dominated Indiana. But, it, but it's, it's amazing. I think they, were, they weren't even seeded going into this thing and won the whole thing. So It was, it was fun to watch them and Santa Clara both, both kind of have upset upset victories in the, in the, in the championship game. It was also, it was really interesting because I believe it was the first time that both the men and the women were at the same location and they played the championship games as a double header. Oh, okay. Yeah. Santa Clara, Santa Clara beat, I believe Stanford yeah. uh, right before. No, no, they beat Florida state, didn't they? Oh yeah. Sorry. Florida yeah. state. I should have known that. And uh, then, uh, uh, you know, Marshall took out Indiana. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, coaches, coaches make a big difference in, in people's lives. I think, and, 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 you know, not to, not to, I'm not going to downplay the importance of high school coaches, but I think college coaches are really in that sweet spot of time with the, the, the athletes and individuals that they're dealing with because they're kind of, they're kind of an adult, but they're not. They're trying to figure out who they are and where their place is in the world and what they're going to do. And I think coaches can have a, obviously a, a, a huge positive impact, but also, you know, if it's a wrong situation, it can be a, a big detriment and you'll see that individual athlete not reach their full potential, unfortunately. Well, Mark, think about it. When, when you drop little Susie or little Johnny off at college and they're an athlete of any sort, Besides their mother and their father, who are they close? Who is, who is, who is, takes over that role in their life? Their coach. Very rarely the biology teacher does, but the coach, <laughs> the coach does. I mean, it was, it was funny. Cause I always, I mean, the, the, 
most strength coaches know what's going on and have a very good feel for the pulse of whatever team they're working with. So I think, you know, as a um, support staff member to any programs that I ever worked with, I knew what was going on within the program probably a little better than the head coach ever knew. Cause oh. I, cause I never determined who played. Well, it's funny you say that. And, and the old adage is if you, if you want answers, go talk to the trainers or go to the strength coach to find out what's really going on within that program. Yep. Well, and, and for those that are trying to play at the next level, uh, past college and to the professional level, um, the scout that's coming to your school is not going to just talk to your head coach. He is going to, he, she are going to go talk to the strength coach, the athletic trainer, and probably the academic advisor to see what kind of person you are. Yeah. So, you know, getting back to, you know, how, how you treat the janitor, uh, you know, it goes a long way on um, deciding the type of individual that you are. So be nice I to also, everybody. Mark, I also, nice think, everybody. I also think this too, is that if you're, if you're not a good person, the system will eventually weed you out. You know, guys that are in the NFL, NBA, baseball, whatever, the people that have long, long careers tend to be probably pretty decent people deep down. You know, you have the exception here and there, but I think I think for the most part, um, I guarantee you Tom Brady is probably a pretty good guy and treats people with a lot of respect and and all that. And that's how he's he's lasted as long as he has. There was a Besides story. Being talented, huh? There was a story about two weeks ago. Somebody brought it up. I, I guess I guess Tom Brady had walked into the locker room and he came up to him and he introduced himself. He's like, "Hey, hey, I'm Tom." And the kid and the rookie's like. Yeah, I, I know who you are, <laughs> but it, but once again, it tells you what kind of person he is. Yeah, I mean, you know, you don't have to like him, but at the same point, you can't you can't say that he, he hasn't taken the most of his physical attributes to the highest level possible. I, I say I say this, Mark, on any team, and a team could be your staff. Okay. We all don't have to like each other, but we will respect each other in the roles we each have. Yeah. And if, if that can happen, then you should be okay. And that, I, the, you know, echoing that sentiment, I, I would always tell the, the athletes, you don't have to like me, but you will respect me. Yeah. And, and, and if you have a problem, my door's always open. You can come in here. We can have a very adult conversation with the door closed. But if you disrespect me in front of your team, I have to address that immediately because well, your teammates cannot cannot think that that's okay to do. If if a student athlete has a major problem with, say, the strength and conditioning coach, it probably comes back to them and the, the lack of effort that they're putting in. And the fact you get on them doesn't mean you don't like them. No. You know, I, I always, I always said is, is that when you're angry, it's an emotion. When you love, it's an emotion. What you really got to watch out for is when someone doesn't really care. That's when you uh, lost them. Yeah, I would tell them if I, if I don't, if I don't keep you accountable, if I don't hold you accountable, and if I'm not yelling, if I'm not in a large voice encouraging you to make your running time, I've given up on you. Yeah. You know, and and that's. It's not because I haven't tried to reach you or I don't care about you, but you've decided based on your effort level that you don't really care about the program and you don't care about being su successful. So we'll figure it out without you. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Chris, what do you got? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to go into, you may want to uh, doctor up my question because I'm sure this is on your mind, but Pat, we're, give us some perspective on where you stand about this talk of athletes potentially college athletes potentially starting to get, you know, monetary rewards in some capacity beyond their scholarships. Well, I understand it's a hot topic and all that. Um, and again, let's, you know, if you're going to use a student athletes likeness to make money, it's probably more at the division one level and probably the high major division one level. And, 
you know, I've spent my whole career at the division one level, except for the last two years here at Marywood. And my opinion is Chris, and it's just my opinion. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong or whatever, but I kind of have a hard time with monetarily paying them. And, I, and I'll tell you why I do because for Mr. Smith, who's writing a check for his Johnny or Susie for $250,000 for them to get a college education, but yet your student athlete gets a college education for free. And by the way, they want for nothing when they're being a student athlete. Well, to me, you're kind of are getting paid, you know? So, you know, I think there's such value in the education that I really struggle with the idea of, of compensating them even more because to me, they are getting compensated with a free education. So let's just say though, we do go down the road where we start compensating. Where does it end? So right off the bat, we're, we're compensating football and basketball. So now are we compensating men's and women's tennis, men's and women's golf? And then after we get through that, now do we have to compensate the cheerleaders? Do we have to compensate the band? Where does it end? You know, so I, I can't say I'm a huge um, proponent of it. Uh, I'd almost like to see if we do go down this, down this road, that if we use a likeness and we have to pay them, don't directly pay the student athlete, but give them an, or set up an annuity for them that they can cash in from a retirement standpoint 40 years down the road. Now, I, could, uh, I, could, I could live with that. Yeah, so uh, you guys are going to have to break this down for me because this is where I'm a, a little bit ignorant. I mean, this, this topic of conversation has to do with universities getting compensated directly from a corporate sponsor and then giving that part, a part of that money to the athlete. Is, is that correct? Is that what, what we're generally talking about? Well, I think it's more, I think it's, it's, it's easier. No, I think it's more along like a licensing and merchandising thing. Let's just say you walk into Sears and Russell t-shirt has made a shirt with a student athlete's number, likeness, and all of that on there. So now what they're saying is the royalty that's being paid back to the university, that student athlete would be entitled to a percentage or the whole royalty. And that's how they would be compensated. Now, currently, um, um, are, are, are athletes able to profit off of their, like, Instagram profiles or a monetized YouTube channel? Are they permitted to do that by NCAA rules? Good question on that. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. At our level, I don't see that at all. Um, you know, I... I think they could, as long as they're not using the skill set. Like if you're a soccer player at UCLA, you're not using soccer to, to make money on your, on your stuff, you know, but I, I don't have a good enough answer on that to, um, to chime in. Well, there's a couple things. There was a place kicker who had an Instagram account and he was doing, uh, field goal kicks. He was doing like trick shots, like, uh, uh, dude perfect but he was doing it uh you know kicking the ball like spinning it and then kicking it but how does it but how does he monetize that because after so many views on youtube or so many likes or so many th hits on instagram then you can get paid you can get you can become a social influencer um one of the things that charles stevenson brought up i believe it was a female athlete at the university of florida um i think it's volleyball she has hundreds of thousands of likes on her Instagram account and she can monetize that now um, through like product endorsement. Like if she, if she's using like oil of Olay skincare products and oil of Olay are not paying her because all of the people that see her on her Instagram page. Um, I think that's what, I think that's one of the ways that the athletes are going to start using their social media presence but is then that, today is that illegal at this point because i thinking back when i was in college i don't think i, I probably tried I, I wanted to get a nike deal but i don't think i was i don't i think that was against ncaa rules i couldn't go get a 
deal from Nike if I wanted to or or, or could. Yeah. I? I mean, because so also, back then, back like then you could. Thing. Yeah, I don't. This whole social media thing, I, I don't want to give you an answer because it could be a wrong answer. Um, I haven't seen those things that you're speaking about. Um, I'm not saying that they don't exist. Uh, my initial thought would be that I, I just don't know. I, I almost feel like it's it, it's if you allow that stuff because they're 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 doing it on their own. They're, they're able to make money from their likeness and image. If the NCAA is restricting that currently, and if they allow that, but then, you know, they're not getting the direct compensation from corporate sponsors via the, uh, the universities. I think that might alleviate some of the problem, but not give up some of the integrity that you would, um, which, which, which I think we would, and, and the purity of, of college sports if it's allowed to happen where they receive direct compensation. That, that's my opinion. Yeah, well, the corporate sponsorship stuff really doesn't have much to do with student athlete. That's basically selling signage in your stadium or, you know, today's game is brought to you by XYZ Corporation or you have an advertisement on your web page. But it, this is what we're talking about is more like using the likeness or using, you know, um, the student athlete's name or whatever to, to compensate them. You know, another thing that I think is extremely, I, I don't get it all. I don't know where you guys sit on it is the whole transfer portal. I mean, to me, you commit to a university. That's your university. You can't be just bouncing around like right now at the end of every year, you don't know who's going to be on your roster next year, but yet the university spend a lot of money recruiting you, uh, giving you a year scholarship, uh, academic advisors, all these things. So you know, to me, if we recruit Mark Spellman to XYZ University and after a year, he wants to go to ABC University, well, then there should be some sort of penalty in there for Mark making that decision to, to leave. Because if, if we're to call him athletics of business, which it is business, well, there's a great deal of expense that goes out in every single, every single student athlete you recruit to that institution. The only the only time I would say it would be okay for the athletes to transfer without having to sit out would be if the head coach that recruited them was either fired or left. I I have no issue with that. But look at Syracuse's women's basketball. Mark, have you been following that? He lost his whole team. How? Everyone is leaving. Why? Well, that's what I would ask. I mean, as as I mean, why why is your whole team leaving? Right. There's got to be a reason. I mean, which, which in that in that case probably goes back to the coach, but let's just say it's a it's a program where three people are leaving at the end of the year. Chances are they're leaving because they're not playing enough, et cetera, et cetera. But those three people were a large expenditure for the university to recruit them in and have them as part of the team. But also on a basketball team, that's twenty percent of your team. Yeah, I mean, it's a fifth of your team, so. It's, it, it's, 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 you know, right now, who was it? I think Gino said it was, it's a complete un, utter mess, which, you know, as, as coaches that worked at the mid-major, you can see where like a kid, you know, a kid comes in his rook his freshman year, I must said rookie year, freshman year, and he's the freshman of the year in the MAC. Well, what's stopping, you know, Kentucky, Florida, and all those other bigger schools. Yeah, poaching them. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, so, so let's just say the guy that came in, let's just use Fairfield again, for instance. You know, Fairfield recruited him. Fairfield gave him a scholarship. Fairfield has a strength and conditioning coach, trainers, academic advisors. They're spending money on this, on this student athlete just for Kentucky now to see how he turns out and then go swoop in and uh, poach him. To me, what are we really teaching? I mean – you know, I, I just think it's wrong in so many, on so many levels. Yes, I would, I would agree. Um, I guess let's go with some closing shots. <laughs> uh, we used to do this and, and because we have such a long relationship, uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, give Chris, give Chris one of your best Mark Spellman stories. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love this. This has been a long time. <laughs> well, keep it clean. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. <laughs> Mark Spellman. I don't have anything negative to say or disparaging at all. Mark Spellman was wonderful. The one thing, the I'm one thing, <laughs> the, the, the one thing that, uh, the one thing that I loved about Mark Spellman is that at Fairfield, you are his, uh, the, the weight and conditioning room was on the ground floor. Okay. All brick walls surrounding it or whatever. I was on the second floor. Okay. And I could hear his voice. I could, hear, I could hear his voice on the second floor at times. <laughs> if I was out on the field, you definitely heard me. Um, I, I'm a big, I'm a big Mark Spellman fan. Uh, I think Mark, I think Mark is in it for all the right reasons. And at the end of the day, he cares so much for the student athlete and what the end product is going to be. Um, I have nothing but sincere gratitude to Mark and, and what he's done in his life. Thank you very much, Pat. You know, it's been a pleasure. It's been, a, it's, it was a pleasure to work with you and for you. And it's been a pleasure continuing to be friends. I don't think you ever, I don't think you ever worked for me. Yeah. They never put me, they never put me underneath you. No, no. <laughs> never, I never answered to you. No. I didn't understand that. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, kept, they kept us separate. <laughs> But Mark, Mark was a Mark was a, a major cog in in some of the successful teams we had there. I mean, I, you know, the Ed Cooley era of men's basketball, um, probably the best era of basketball that Fairfield had, um, maybe ever. Um, Mark was a big part of that. So, and I, uh, I I made this this point before, and I and I mean it. I stand by it. I'm just not saying it because Mark's my friend. But besides the Baylor basketball team, that 2009 to 2012 men's basketball at Fairfield, they were the best looking athletes I've seen. You know, from a physical perspective, because of the work that he did with them. Was that Ed, was that Ned Cooley's years or? Yeah. Yeah. There were some ugly dudes though. They weren't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but they were diesel. Yeah, they were yoked. We had, we had good teams then. Oh, yeah. Pat, uh, people want to get in touch with you. How can they do that? Best way to get in touch with me is by email. Uh, PR Murphy at Marywood.edu. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. There's a lot of good information for sure. Well, Chris, thank you. And like I said, I'm a fan of your show. And... Um, you know, I think what you put out there is very valuable for people to see. So I commend you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us your time, your uh, expertise, and another aspect into what people need to understand when they're going to the next level in their athletic career and development. And thank you for your friendship. Uh, you're welcome, Mark. Thank you for yours. All right, Chris, really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Pat. All right, bye, guys. Don't go anywhere, Murph. Okay. <laughs> we are Athlete Hackers. My name is Chris Schrade. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Uh, did I mention we have a YouTube channel? I think I did, right? Yes. If you want to come on the show, email at us at info at athletehackers.com. Take us out, Mark. That is Chris Schrade. I am Mark Spellman. We are Athlete Hackers. Have a wonderful day. All my best. God bless. And as always, peace. That's that big voice you heard on the second. Some of you were wondering why why birds were migrating in August. <laughs> Peace. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>